Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you are all doing well and staying safe. My name is Maria Asher, and I'm a part of the investments management team that manages the Westwood Select strategy. We wanted to take this opportunity to talk about our economic outlook, where we are seeing opportunities and how we are positioning our portfolios. We also have Leah Bennett and Adrian Helford joining us on the call today. Leah is the president of Westwood Wealth Management, Houston, and the lead, management, ma lead manager on the Westwood Select strategy. Adrian is the director of multi-asset portfolios and a specialist in macroeconomics. With that, I would like to hand over to Adrian, who will talk about our economic outlook. Hi, Adrian. Hi, great. Thank you. And thank you all for your time. I, I hope to help you think through some of the primary economic impacts so far, some of the potential paths going forward. Just starting at the top level, we do think this is very different than the nature of previous economic events that have led to a market correction. We're experiencing something that I've termed the consumption void that's leading our usual economic engine in the United States, which is consumption or a 75% contribution to the annual economic output to grind to a halt. Uh, considering how much economic impact we will see is a little bit of a question of how much output contraction does this lead to each quarter and a lot more of how long is this consumption void going to continue? On the how much of the near-term output contraction, we're already seeing the negative impacts in unemployment reports this last two weeks. That's probably the first indication we get, and it's going to get worse. Uh, we are currently forecasting the unemployment rate in the second quarter is going to end up near 15%. That's from a low of around 3.5% ending 2019 and higher than at any time since the Great Depression. Usually, economic theory or Okun's law estimates a 2% loss of economic output, that's gross domestic product or GDP, for every 1% increase in unemployment. While we don't think we'll see a 30% loss in economic output in the second quarter, that's just doing the math from a 15% unemployment expectation, the loss is still going to be dramatic and sharp which is exactly why the central bank and the government or the treasury have acted so strongly and forcefully with the aim of helping consumers and businesses bridge the consumption void. So thinking about that second part, uh, how long it's going to continue is really the hardest question to answer. We do believe there are three parts to restarting the consumption engine from a virus scare. The first is going to be fast and comprehensive testing where I gain confidence venturing out in the communal areas where others are tested and clear. Several companies are already purportedly very near the stage of, of having a fast and comprehensive testing paradigm, and we're going to see that in short order. The second piece is treatment solutions. Given uh, where we are now, just getting us to a mortality rate of seasonal flu levels lowers, lowers the fear of actual infection. At least one pharmaceutical company is likely to shortly have results on a potential treatment in the next month or two. It's stated to be hopefully this month we'll start to see progress on that. The final stage is going to be vaccination, of course, so it's not transmissible to the vaccinated. Just testing and producing the millions of vaccinations required is likely to take the longest, and that's going to be the longest stage. You should be thinking that of uh, well, how long before I'm I'm comfortable getting out and without second thought, taking my family to the movie theater and sitting with 200 other individuals around me. That's when we start to see consumption really normalize. At current, our central expectation is for an activity resumption in the latter part of 2020 as infection rates drop with warmer weather and large scale testing and treatment options hopefully emerge. Some degree of pent up demand from people like myself that can't wait to get back out to the restaurant at this point and unemployed coming back from furlough will lead to a reasonably strong bounce in economic output. We don't see an immediate recovery to previous levels of high economic output or low unemployment and by consequent tightened market valuations, real economic damage is being done and a contraction from the longest economic growth cycle in history uh, is going to naturally lead consumers to think about tightening their belts a little bit regardless, delaying purchases and increasing savings rates until we see that final stage of more clarity and you're comfortable going back out to the movie theater. 
Finally, the fiscal and monetary policy help that we have seen from the U.S. government are truly ex extraordinary and beyond anything in modern history by orders of magnitude. In very short order, we have enacted central bank programs to keep the market orderly and fiscal spending programs that will help us bridge the consumption void for at least the second quarter. A faster virus solution will be very positive for markets, while a slower one probably leads to additional fiscal help from the government. That does lead to some support for markets from dropping significantly further from here, as we have been shown that there is high support for trying to and recognition for what the problem is for bridging that that void. Uh, if you're interested in a slightly more detailed layout of our outlook and positive, positive and negative scenarios, please do reach out to your contact or Leah and they'll be able to send that to you. Uh, looking at companies and sectors, the outlook certainly leads to areas to avoid and opportunities. And of course, uh, Leah Bennett is here to talk to you about that. All yours, Leah. Thank you so much, Adrian. As um, to drill down a little bit more on Adrian's comments around healthcare, healthcare is a sector where we found a lot of opportunity over the past um, the past month. Not only does the sector usually hold up um, during um, defensively when the economy turns down, but certainly it benefits from this current uh, health crisis. So currently there's more than 140 experimental drug treatments and vaccines for the coronavirus that are in development worldwide. Most are in early stages, but 11 are already in clinical trials. If you want to expand that and count drugs approved for already approved on the market for other diseases, there are 254 clinical trials testing treatments or vaccines for the virus. Many spearheaded by universities or government research agencies with hundreds of more clinical trials planned later on this year. Researchers have squeezed timelines that usually total months into weeks or even days. And I love there's a great quote by um, Johnson and Johnson's um, chief scientific officer that we've never gone so fast with so many resources in such a short period of time. Since I quoted J um, Johnson and Johnson's uh, uh, chief scientific officer, I should mention that is a stock that uh, we like. Um, Johnson & Johnson has announced that they are working on a vaccine. Um, the stock has a really pretty attractive valuation because it has been depressed due to um, the litigation they've been involved with with their talcum powder. And we think the risk reward is attractive here. The only add is one that Adrian um, alluded to that already has um, a drug approved for malaria, where we think there's additional applications um, for the coronavirus. That's a stock that we like, and there should be some clinical data coming out um, in, the next, in the next month or so, um, possibly in the next couple of weeks, if, um, to be optimistic. Uh, Regeneron is another stock that we like that has a very promising pipeline. But another one that we do like is Regeneron. Um, that has a very promising pipeline and does have a, a drug for um, COVID-19 in, um, in their pipeline. Uh, two other stocks that we like are Abbott Labs and Beckton Dickinson. They both have testing kits for the detection of um, the virus. Abbott has been in the news as of late because they, do, they have um, launched a test kit that allows for the detection of the virus within five minutes. Its test kit is probably a bit better than Beckton Dickinson, but capacity is going to be an issue for everyone because there's so much demand. And as a result, we think there'll probably be multiple winners in the space. Um, Emergent Biosolutions, another stock we like. Emergent is a really interesting um, company in that they manufacture vaccines, but they don't take the, um, the risk around research and development. So as an example, they, they do have a strategic relationship with the U.S. government. Um, they are the sole um, manufacturers for the anthrax vaccine for the U.S. government, and that contract is held by the Department of Defense. So we think ultimately when a vaccine is found, they will probably participate in, um, in some of the manufacturing. Honeywell is another company that we like that um, recently started manufacturing respirators. And again, as we've seen, that's going to be an area of high demand. And I do think when we get into market volatility, um, it's, it becomes, sometimes people become challenged on um, looking for entry points. Um, everybody loves to, um, to buy things uh, when they're close to the low. 
But I think looking at companies like this, what we're ultimately looking for is companies whose cash flow are increasing. And if that's the case, ultimately the market is usually pretty efficient over the long run. And if cash flows are increasing, stock prices should theoretically um, go up. Um, and we think that'll be uh, the case over the next several months with these particular companies. Thank you so much, Leah. We have been hearing from our clients with different questions that we wanted to discuss today. My, my first question is for Adrian. Adrian, what effect do you think this massive government stimulus will have on our deficit? How long do you think it will take us to dig out of the enormous hole that this spending will create? Good question. I don't think to say that this blows a hole in the budget is too strong of a statement. Uh, economically, the U.S. has been prospectively spending or increasing the deficit in good times. So we're a bit of caught in the crisis on our back foot. Even before the coronavirus, the budget deficit was rising, increasing around 25 percent in the last 12 months. And the national debt has increased to around 23 trillion, which is now well greater than 100 percent of debt to GDP, the usual metric. Uh, that said, the massive government stimulus that we have done is absolutely necessary, and even more may be necessary before it's done, likely will be necessary, in order for the economy to continue functioning um, in a way that allows us to avoid a, a depression scenario. It's, it's a pretty strong uh, downside piece that we have here. But yes, with the currency, uh, a $2 trillion plus fiscal package, the uh, the deficit will double this year and is likely to stay high next year. Uh, that deficit is going to take the national debt from around 23 trillion today to around 29 trillion next year in a time where economic growth is likely lower than average. Uh, near term, more deficit spending will be required to bridge that consumption void we talked about. Medium and longer term, we're either going to have to grow at a fast pace, that's not our central expectation or tighten our belts further to prepare for higher expected taxes in the future, or simply print money to pay down the debt. And that's an emerging school of thought known as mon monetary theory that often ends in bad outcomes for emerging markets to describe this. But it's a, it's a narrow path in order to, to get both growth and bridge that consumption void. What all this means is that the height, heightened deficit and debt load will create a natural ballast against resurgent high growth from the fiscal program. While we do expect us to be able to bridge the gap and emerge from the crisis on a growth path, we expect that it's going to be an average lower slow growth, uh, slower growth path for at least the next five years. Thank you so much, Adrian. Leah, my next question is for you. Where do you see the future opportunities lie in terms of investments? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you look at the sectors that have been hit the hardest as we've gone through this downturn, it's been um, energy, it's been travel and leisure. We've seen the airlines, the hotels, the restaurants, um, the retail stores really hit hard. Um, and so what we've been looking at are um, companies where the stocks are down significantly, but where there's a business model where there's no tangible asset they have to maintain. So um, to give you an example of what we don't think is attractive, so if you take the, the cruise companies, for example, um, obviously their revenues have come down significantly, but they have a tangible asset they have to maintain um, through this downturn. So they have a lot of cash outflow, a lot of capital expenditures associated with maintaining that asset. Um, so we've been looking at for companies where there's more um, flexible business models um, and one um, that we definitely like is Booking.com. So Booking.com benefits from travel, but it's a software company and um, they own Priceline, um, Orbitz, Hotels.com. They have $11 billion in cash, so a really solid um, balance sheet, but there's just not a lot of um, strain on their cash outflow during this period. So that's a stock we, um, we, we like um, and are looking more for companies that fit that sort of business model. And then to echo um, Adrian's comment, I think there is a lot of pent up demand for, um, for people visiting restaurants when um, this, these lock-in situations are over. So that's an area where we're looking for some opportunities. And um, I think we'll probably add to the portfolio in that area. Thank you, Leah. That was very interesting. Uh, Adrian, a question for you. 
as more people are under a shutdown and staying in, how do you think it makes the companies rethink their supply chain management? Well, um, at the very inception of this virus impact really starting, that's around early mid-February, the supply chain was the first of the dominoes to fall. We were still working, shopping, going to the movie theaters and buying cars, but our suppliers in China and other places for parts for those new cars, iPhones, et cetera, were experiencing shutdown of plants, forcing thousands of companies to throttle down or temporarily shut assembly and manufacturing plants in the United States and Europe. The concern at that time was whether the global supply chain problem would lead to a demand problem and a subsequent economic slowdown. While we're here now, and it is a demand problem, as the economy restarts and demand resurgence, resurges, companies will certainly take a hard look, we think, at their global supply chains for areas to reduce the risk of a similar closure in the future, potentially vertically, vertically integrating uh, and repatriating portions of the supply chain. In other words, smartphone makers might want to own a critical uh, part maker's plant for some of their phones. Auto companies might want to own, own more of the input parts of companies. That's the vertical integration. Repatriating means we could see less globalization and more working with local suppliers. This could lead to opportunities for us as investors in industrial input companies, right? right for vertical integration purchases, among other things. Leah, uh, my question is for you. Um, so you talked about the sectors that you are interested in and like, which sectors you are most cautious about? Yeah, another great question. Um, so I, I did mention one of the hardest hit sectors has been energy. And energy um, now over the last two years has been the most volatile sector and um, the worst performing sector. And there's there's been a nice little appreciation over the last um, week or so, but it's been a really challenging area as, um, as there is a lot more supply on the market because of the energy revolution that we went through in the US um, a few years ago. And then obviously we have um, a significant decrease in demand um, as a result of this health crisis that's occurred. So we, we do own um, two stocks in this, um, in this space, um, and we have stayed defensive, owning companies that we think have the strongest balance sheets. Um, we have actively um, changed our position over the last year in that we can, we've had the opportunity to tax loss harvest several positions. So if an individual thinks about their, um, their different accounts, you have IRAs and um, retirement accounts that are tax deferred, that you're not having to pay gains every year um, to the, uh, you're not having to pay a tax on your gains every year to the government. And then you have your, um, your savings account and um, trust accounts where each year, um, based on your realized gains, you have to, um, you have to pay a uh, the tax um, tax to the government. And one of our goals with the select strategy is to keep our realized uh, gains low. And so we have used the, the opportunity from the volatility in that sector in order to um, uh, larvis, harvest losses and um, keep our tax liability low for clients. But this isn't a sector that we're looking to have a larger weight in um, versus the market. And it's also, um, an area that we think it's been challenging because it's also an area where we think we need strategically some um, exposure because if you do have third parties um, such as the Saudis or the Russians that come to some sort of agreement, you can get significant moves in the in the group. So that's not my favorite um, sector, um, but I do think there needs to be a little bit of exposure. And then the other area is utilities, um, and utilities held up really well coming into this downturn and, and benefited our portfolio and our, um, and our clients. But now we have risk rewards that are heavily skewed towards other sectors. And so we've used that really as a source of fund um, to fund some of our new ideas. So um, I'm, I'm not, I don't like sector, uh, I don't like utilities as much um, at, at these levels. Thank you so much, Leah. My last question is for Adrian. So Adrian, Adrian, as we see the containment in new coronavirus cases, hopefully soon, 
and people start returning to normal what do you think this new normal economy will look like uh gosh what a big and broad question it's amazing when you think that we went from questioning all the previous normal economy in mid february and here some 6 weeks later the expectations for the future state of the normal economy have completely changed uh, i do believe there are areas of process and technological change for which we have uh painfully accelerated our adoption of which will be a good thing in the longer term i'm in my office at home and suddenly it's normal to attend conferences by a zoom video call or having food delivered from restaurants with uber eats a delivery service and cooking class subscriptions have actually spiked many or most of these technologies existed before but now a large section of the population that didn't previously adopt these as much is learning and using these new skills so i do expect in short order uh that we are seeing more people work from home at least part of the time and that's even once we go back fully to work that could mean more suburbia suburbia um purchasing on homes where it's more attractive to live outwards as opposed to commuting distance in city alongside that i would i wager that many of those companies with large expensive offices in new york city and san francisco are quickening plans to head to new jersey and and oakland or further as we see changes like that the so-called gig economy uh, may have just gotten a reasonably sustained boost as well as many of those workers will be needed over areas like construction uh, the technology sector had already been performing well pre coronavirus and i would expect this sector leadership uh, could continue and as we have quickly learned by force from technology adoption uh, even my mother is now paying for zoom for long video calls with her with her bridge friends there are are too many potential changes to go through now but we are thinking through long term trends that will impact our investments not just in technology but also as we have said in in restaurants where a a wipe out of smaller players could provide market share for larger public chains uh, healthcare and pharmaceuticals where reduced regulation could re- reduce reduce capital costs for them a lot has happened in 6 weeks and is continuing from an investment perspective it's if you're hearing from lea and companies and sectors we are acting nimbly and adapting to the new realities that we see now thank you so much adrian these are all the questions i had today thank you everyone once again for joining us please feel free to reach out to your advisor if you have any questions be well stay safe and have a wonderful rest of the day goodbye